Praise the Lord. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Get the pulpit back. thankful for the power of the Lord. Amen. I'm not serving a, a dead God. I'm serving a mighty risen Savior. It's in the world today. Amen. Amen. I know that it's a little bit later and I promise <clears throat> I will take heed to that. Praise the Lord. But I do have a thought I'd like to share with you. So if you'd be so kind for the reading of the word of the Lord, I'd like to draw your attention to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 and 35. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and, it came, and they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he, Jesus, saith to his disciples, Sit he, ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And he said to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry you here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed, If it were possible, the hour might pass me. You see, Jesus begins to war the mind games of the flesh. Gethsemane is the place of the soul and its fight for eternity. Gethsemane is the place where our nature of disobedience is simply revealed to us. And then it becomes the battle of good and evil, right versus wrong. Is it my will or is it his will? Could I tell you that victory depends on how we leave the garden? Will we leave it by the flaming sword to keep us out? Or will we leave it with submission to the cross? It's now the battle in the garden. Our walk in the garden. Gethsemane's vision of Christ in my life known as the battle of the mind. Today, it's my hope to simply show you an example of Gethsemane that is for you and I to behold. The mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would anoint these lips of clay, my heart and mind, stir our souls that we would understand, Lord. Oh, anoint me, Lord, as you have given this to me, I pray right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you may be seated. Sister Ray, don't just stay right there. Keeps me on cue. In our world today, we simply have a lot of mental things in our minds, don't we? But as we begin to look at the book of Mark, we find that there is a place God would desire to go. God loved walking in the garden. We don't have to look back very far, but to the very beginning, and we find that God chose the garden to walk into. He loved to walk amongst His creation. He loved to go beside the still waters. He loved the forestry. He, he loved the animals that He created. So much so that He decided to form man into his own image thus he began the time of mankind then God loved to take time to walk in the garden with man oh how wonderful it was to walk with the creator mankind had the best of all that could ever be thought of peace that passeth every understanding there there wasn't no ill there wasn't no wrong there was no evil there was no darkness but there was simply the light of God that walked with man I don't know about you 
But I am so hungry to be able to walk with the very essence and the presence of my Creator. So we find that God has chosen a garden to walk with His people in. I find it ironic that we would find in the Gospels where Jesus would go to a place, a garden, Gethsemane, and He would desire to walk with His followers there. But oft times after the darkness had fallen on man's eyes, we can no longer keep the pace of the presence of God. And so God would still love to go to that familiar place and begin to visit one more time. Oh, there he could visit mankind as oft times before and enjoy the company of a like-minded, just be simply being in the presence of his creation. You see, it's at Gethsemane that we learn it is a place Jesus was familiar with. It would be where he would learn to walk with this new man, this old man, but a new nature of man. You see, we need to learn how to walk in the garden. We don't need to be driven by our flesh. Oftentimes we are driven by the desire of our flesh. It shouldn't be because of our thoughts, our wants, our will, our desire, our mindset. But it should be that I desire to have the mind of Christ. Uh, oftentimes we'll find that great apostle as he begins to describe to us uh, we need to have the mind of Christ uh, to be able to walk across uh, the minefields of this worry. If we could just simply have the mind uh, of Christ. But I'd like to bring to you today that really we don't understand the mind of Christ. I like what Mark does. He begins to paint a picture of the garden. You see, Mark's version gives a look at the Creator dealing with mental darkness of His creation. In fact, Mark is known as the earliest of the Gospels. Mark would be the one that would well, run around with Peter. Him and Peter were real close, and he would be that scribe that would pen those first words. He, he would hear the Gospel message. He would hear about uh, being filled with Jesus and uh, Spirit and, and being baptized in, into Christ's name. He, he would be the, that one that would prescribe that, that in the end time, they will know them by the, the speaking in other tongues, that Spirit spirit of utterance that would come forth. It would be in this type of mind frame that Mark would write. In fact, it would be the foundation that all the other Gospels would build upon. And so in his version, we simply get a visual of our Creator in a different mode altogether. You see, it's a battle of the mind. Many times the evil will try to make us think that we've lost our mind. Anybody feel like maybe somewhere down along the line you've lost your mind? That's the enemy, the stresses of this natural life moving in, this life of disobedience that sometimes claims us, and we need to find a way to overcome those things. So it becomes a plague or a ba battle of the mind. And so to overcome this darkness, Jesus would have to overcome the mind of his own flesh. Mark begins to show Jesus' expressions, his emotions, his very actions in raw detail as he would begin to scribe to them his feeling, his closest followers. Man, I feel sorrowful. I feel heavy about what's about to happen. There's something in my future that shakes me to the core. So much that the writer would give emphasis that we would understand that there was a sorrowfulness and a terror that the Lord was feeling in his flesh at the moment of Gethsemane. In the moment of his place of familiarity, of being the God that could conquer everything, he looked into the darkness of the sin sect of man's mind and found out how deviant, how flawed it really was. And what it scared him was that how far he would have to go to redeem that mind. Hey, I'm not telling you, Jesus turned from that and said, It's too big, it's too much of a cross to bear. No, I'm telling you. 
you. He looked at it with a firm determination, a spirit and soul that said, I will be the Redeemer. I will be that one that will pay the price. The mind of man may be dark, but Christ said there's no valley too low. There's no mountain too high that I'm going to cross it to obtain the goal. And the goal that I have, James, John, and Peter, is that one day you'll be able to preach the gospel message with power and authority. Because those things that you've seen me do, you shall do greater by my Spirit. And so we find that this picture of the Creator realizing how deep and dark man had just simply become. Josephus, the historian of the Old Testament, would write that the gardens were common in the outskirts of Jerusalem, such as Gethsemane would be at the foothills of the Mount of Olives. In fact, the word itself, Gethsemane, means a place of the olive press. It would be this place that Jesus would desire and often go. It would be a place that he would press his flesh into the submission of the Spirit of God. It would not only be his refuge, but it would be a place of atonement. It would be a, a place that he could recognize what it was that, that he had to do and to accomplish. We know it's a common theme and a common thing that, that the Lord would do because we find that Judas would find Jesus in Gethsemane. He would find him at this place of pressing. Jesus would bring his closest to them because he wanted them to be a part and there they would behold this sudden change in demeanor of his expression in his voice in his look in his actions as the Lord would begin to speak with a great heaviness about the future tense of what the world would face his mind was learning Christ's mind was comprehending just how lost and fragile and dark humanity had become and he was in total amazement and terrified at what he was about to walk into but he didn't stop there because he said father nevertheless not my will but your will be done it's by the will of Jesus Christ that we can conquer the things of our flesh and the state and the nature of our mind to be more than conquerors through him So Jesus' next step from the garden was to overcome his state of mind. You see, we're going to all have to overcome our state of mind because it affects every move that we make from the time we become a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, there's some mental statistics and research, uh, excuse me, research would show that mental illnesses are common and it affects tens of millions of individuals yearly. Estimates suggest that only half of the people with mental illness will even receive some sort of treatment. They have found throughout their 75 years of studying mental illness that mental illness would be broken into two categories. One would be known as the AMI, the Any Mental Illness, and the other would be known as the SMI, the serious mental illness. Simple, right? The AMI would encompass the all recognized mental illnesses that are familiar to us. The SMI is a smaller and more severe uh, subset of the AMI. And along with these categories of mental illnesses that humankind would have to deal with, would be those of the elements of the mind such as anxiety disorders, attention deficit, hyperactive disorder, better known as ADHD. 
uh, there would be the autism spectrum of disorder, the ASD, the bipolar disorder, the eating disorder, the major depression, the obsessive compulsive disorder known as the OCD, the personality disorder, the post-traumatic stress disorder, schizophrenia, and, and suicide, and the list could go on and on and on. What I'm trying to tell you is that the condition and the state of our complex human thinking goes very deep and it can go very dark and that's exactly what our God looked at as he went to his familiar place and he began to look at the state and the condition of mankind could I zero in a little bit and zone it in to you that the Lord went to a common place of a garden a place of refuge a place of pressing and he's seen you there and he's drawing you close I don't know Lord my st mental status isn't the status quo. I'm too overcome and burdened by the things that the world has pinned to me. They say I'm crazy. They say I'll never understand. But I stand in your presence and the Lord looks back, not in a terrifying moment, but in simple amazement to tell you that there's no place you can go that I cannot reach you. There's no mountain you will climb that I won't be with you. There's no valley too low uh, that I'm going to walk with you. Uh, I'll be there on the mountaintop. Uh, I'll be in the valley low. Uh, I'll be your redeemer. You see, we've got to understand the mental statistics of ourselves in the garden that pressed. It pressed in on Christ that day. In fact, it would go later in bar Mark, the, the next passages of Scripture, as he began to fall out and begin to pray. There was a couple of instances that he went back to his disciples and had to awake them. You see, when it comes to our mental state of mind, there's too much of a heavy state that we can't stay awake spiritually. But the Lord said, I prayed the prayer. The Lord said, I've mentioned your name. Oh, Peter. Satan would sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. Oh, saint child of the Most High God, you're battling the issues of your flesh. Why don't you come into the wine press, come into the garden, and allow me to change you, allow me to remold you, allow me to make you a new creature in my image. You see, we got to come to a place that our battle of mind which would be the hardest of the fight to fight. It's just simply a spiritual nature in fight because Jesus has already bought it. He's already paid it. He's already fought it. And he's overcome it. Now with a proper state of mind, knowing that the Lord will come for you at any moment in time, any place you are, now we can start talking about what Easter really means. It's not until we get our mind right. It's not until we can walk with Him and know the values of His blood. It's not until my mind says, Lord, I'm giving it all to you, that we wouldn't understand the stretching forth upon a cross and driving nails into the hands and the feet of a man that looked and said, I'm the Redeemer. I am the Christ. I am that I am is hanging here for you. And now I'm redeeming you. I wonder if you stand with me here today. You want the mind of Christ, then dwell in Him. His mind in you and your mind in us. You see, His ways are above our ways. His thoughts above my thoughts. So I'm simply going to leave it to Him. He's going to fight this battle. I'm just going to live in Him. I'm going to continue into the garden. I'm going to be submitted to His cause.